There's the mic. We hit, or I hit, every possible technical difficulty I could have <laughs> getting today's stream up and running. But we are here, and we are continuing with our case study that I've been developing. My case study. I keep saying our. Yeah, this is as much yours as it is mine. Because, uh, yeah, the, the comments do help. Having you participate in here and... Uh, participate through the chat does help. So I definitely consider these streams our effort. <laughs> in any case, today we are picking up that case study and to the request of one of our subscribers, we are doing V-Ray for Rhino. And here opening up the file that we had yesterday, this render is, oh, wrong thing. This is a client project. <laughs> Kept working after last night's streams, there we go. So because of the level of detail that we have in the model, it's not going to be a great render. I'm going to say that from the get go. Uh, not great in the sense that it's not going to come off as photoreal. As photorealistic as the lighting and the materials may be, there is not enough detail in the model to really call out for photorealism. So I'm going to approach V-Ray a little differently here. I'm going to approach V-Ray from the point of view of let's make this a stylized render. And then from there, if we can add in some details to kind of push this more to a photoreal level, then cool. But basically, I'm working with a trial here of V-Ray. And what you see here floating around is the V-Ray toolbar. So I'm going to lock this in right there. Yeah. So there's my V-Ray toolbar. And rather than go through, rather than go through everything of V-Ray, I am simply going to focus in on certain aspects. So, hey there, EM, see you there in the chat. Thanks for joining in. And the, uh, the aspects that we're gonna focus in on today are lighting and materials. So, this is the V-Ray toolbar, this is the main toolbar. After that, you get like the rendering toolbar, the geometry toolbar, the proxy toolbar, which like proxies are, should be easier than they are. That would be a whole that would be a whole stream in its own. And utilities, lights, and the compact version. So I'm gonna close all these up because the majority of all these tools are available to me in the overall toolbar, which is the one that I have set up there. I'm gonna close all these out. And by the way, if you install V-Ray, trial or licensed, and you go over to render, or you go to render, or you try to pull up these toolbars and you can't, you do have to go to render current renderer and set that to V-Ray for Rhino. It looks like I actually have to do that right now. So render current renderer and switch it from render Rhino to whatever other renderers you may have, but V-Ray for Rhino. And with that enabled, we can start rendering with Rhino or with V-Ray. <laughs> so the first thing would be a camera. So we do want to set a camera. I do so usually through named views and there's a difference between named views and say snapshots. That's not what I'm covering today. We're gonna do just named views. So I wanna set this as a view that I wanna have of this particular piece. And in order to do so, let's say I'm actually gonna have two of these side by side. So it's not just one of them. And I'm actually gonna turn this other one 180 degrees so that in this render, it actually looks like we have two experiences going on. Oh, rotated on the wrong axes. There we go. But what we're actually doing is we're looking at both sides of this piece. And it could, kind of, it could actually be kind of cool to kind of see it from like a front view. I think I'm going to do it that way. So first things first, I'm going to go into my viewport settings. And over here, in order to get a good wide angle of the entryway, which this also, I'm just gonna go ahead and save this view right here. Uh, save, I'm gonna save that as interior and named views. I'm gonna zoom out to get this front view. And I'm actually gonna switch here. So previously in order to get that wide angle view, I had gone into properties, camera, lens, millimeter, lens length, and I set it to 18, which is pretty wide angle before you start getting distorted. I think you can go 16, still get some good perspective. When you get to 14 and 12, I mean, it still looks okay because we're far away, but like 
at 12 or even like 14, there's a lot of distortion going on, right? Like in the sense that if I go here, I mean, yeah, it's just super wide angle. Um, at least in, especially like if you're using a camera and you go to 10 or 12, that's where you start to get a fisheye effect where things start rounding out. I suppose the way that the Rhino camera works here is it doesn't do like a fisheye effect when you get that wide. I imagine in general 3D software you don't, but I'm actually gonna go with 50 here, which is a pretty nice angle to view at like farish away. And then I'll just same that name view as front view. So with our named views set up, we basically have our cameras set up. Like if I exported this file as an FBX, it would basically export these named views as camera views. There's just no like actual physical camera in 3D space to move around as we've seen in Blender. So let's just snap back to this view. Let's open up our V-Ray editor. So we do that but just by hitting the V-Ray logo. Uh, failed to check out a V-Ray for Rhino license. Is you? It looks like you are not logged in. Do you wanna log in now? I'm gonna hit yes. And I tried doing this already, I'm not sure why. Trying to log in over here on the side view and it just keeps, rather than actually taking me to the login page, it keeps refreshing the current screen. So I'm gonna try and, I'm doing it a different way right now. Bear with me. Great time to uh, plug in questions in the chat <laughs> when uh, I'm troubleshooting stuff. All right, I'm logged in, putting the V-Ray asset or would you like to log in? Yes. Okay, nothing happened, so I'm logged in. All right, let's try it this way. Let's, uh, when in doubt, close and open everything again. It's always something with you. Let's see, render, okay. Your asset editor, login, yes. Sign in complete. You may now close this window. Okay, at least that's something. So I hit the V-Ray asset editor, successful activation. My browser is saying everything's good. Ah, here it is. V-Ray Asset Editor. Okay, we're back on. So, V-Ray Asset Editor. The main things here, if we go over to our main panel, right, we've got materials. So we had generic, emissive, two-sided, right? Like this is our top bar, obviously, and then our bottom bar. So here we can, uh, this is creating an asset. So creating a material, a texture, a light, some geometry, or different render elements. There's a lot to talk about here. That's why I'm just focusing on materials and lights because that's mainly what you kind of want to use V-Ray for. And that's what, if you were to do Rhino materials and Rhino lights, it doesn't translate the same as V-Ray lights or V-Ray materials. So that's really where you want to start with V-Ray and Rhino. We can open an asset or import an asset file. We can save an asset to an independent file. So. Uh, everything that we do for V-Ray within that Rhino file is just going to be contained to that Rhino file unless you save that asset to a specific file and then import it in another file. So that's why we would save an asset to a file. And then over here we have purge unused assets. Super useful. All the stuff that you kind of create that you're no longer using, you get rid of it. Anything that's existing in the file already that is relevant to V-Ray will show up here. So this is our main asset editor. So we have our lights, our geometries, our textures. Up here on the left, we have materials. So I can also just hit there to start opening up a material. Then we've got lights, we've got geometries, we've got, what is this called again? Render elements, which is basically your different layers. Well, we may talk about that because it is relevant to materials, especially if you're going to Photoshop out of Rhino. And finally, textures, we may or may not cover that for materials. That's also something that could be on all its own. For settings in V-Ray, this is important right off the bat. So we're gonna do a render before we do any materials or lights. We wanna make sure our render is set up before we do any work. So we go to settings and we've got our engine, CPU, CUDA, RTX. 
So I, this is something you may have to look up for Chaos Group or V-Ray. What should you be using for your system? I can tell you right now, I know off the top of my head, CPU is if you don't have a GPU. You won't even be able to select these if you don't have a GPU. If you do have a GPU, it's got to be on CUDA architecture. So that means NVIDIA brand uh, 10 series and under, RTX NVIDIA brand 20 series and under. If you have no idea what I'm saying, uh, look up your system specs. <laughs> look up what you should, what render engine you should be using for your graphics card. So I know that mine for a 30 series NVIDIA card, I need RTX. Progressive. So progressive is the type of rendering style we want to use for our final render. For a progress render, I want to turn this off in order to set it to interactive. Quality, medium's fine. Update effects at the end of the render, yes. Denoise, always nice. Uh, NVIDIA AI is much better than V-Rays. Open image is good for the final render pass, but for an interactive or current view, NVIDIA AI for denoising, it's gonna be your best bet. Camera, so this is just some camera settings like loose ones, uh, exposure levels is typically what I'll tweak. Depth of field, always nice to have, not gonna turn it on yet. When I add some photorealism, that's always a really quick and easy way to add photorealism is to introduce some depth of field. Vignetting as well. And basically like all the stuff that adds photorealism mimics how a camera works, not necessarily how your eye works. Big difference there. Like chromatic aberration got popular. Chromatic aberration is where you have like greens and purples um, kind of messing with the outline of objects that are far away. That's a lens distortion that happens through a camera glass. It's not real. Your eye doesn't pick that up. It doesn't exist in the real world. And yet people add that effect now to photos to make them crappier, <laughs> to add that photorealistic effect. In my opinion, it's not an effect that you want to add in for photorealism, but it can be a cool stylistic effect. Anyway, that's not even an option here. That's <laughs> something you can add in Blender. But here in V-Ray for Rhino, we have depth of field and vignetting. So render output. Uh, this is the resolution of the render. I'm going to leave that as it is. Or we want to save our image. So whenever we want to export our image, rather than having to make sure we save it, we can set a place for it to save in our directory and then walk away and know that our render will be saved when it's finished. Animation, not for today's topic, but no, you can do that. Environment, we may talk about this. This is really just uh, the 360 around of where our uh, image is placed. Material override, pretty straightforward if you want everything to render in one material, which I'm actually going to enable right now, and the default is fine. I want to just see everything in gray. And swarm would be for cloud rendering. So with that, our render is set. I'm going to go over here and hit this bottom right arrow to open up more options. And I don't want to render in the cloud because I'm on the trial, but I'll do interactive right here, render with V-Ray interactive. And that'll open up this window. And the cool thing about this window is once the render gets going, should be any day now. Choose render mode, uh, interactive. I chose interactive. Is Rhino stuck? Or can I not do interactive? I'm hitting all the options and getting nowhere. I think I'm glitching. So I'm gonna close and save. That's weird. Ah, yes, save changes. That was a weird way to get stuck. Just give me the same option over and over. Luckily, opening and closing is as quick as that, and anything we hit save on is gonna save for V-Ray as well. So, let's try that again. We just hit render. Choose render mode. There we go. Okay, so we have our render in this little view right here. So if I rotate around in the Rhino viewport, 
basically our camera right here mirrors what we see. All right, and we see there wherever we have less light, the render is obviously going to take longer. Okay, so I actually want to close out of that and click right here to stop the rendering because I can use this drop down right here and I can set this view to V-Ray Interactive. So when you enable the V-Ray plugin, this should show up, V-Ray Interactive. And if we hit that, then this viewport itself, instead of that separate window, will become the render. Cool, so you could do it, you know, I have multiple monitors, so ideally I'd like to have my render going off on the side and I'd be modeling in Rhino or editing the scene however I want here because I can change stuff without changing the render camera. And that's important, right? Like if this view weren't changing as I was kind of doing some work on the model, it's less on the computer than like every little move I make or every little change I make, it's having to do double the work, you know, basically. So if you have multiple monitors, definitely keep this in a separate window. For the sake of showing you, I have it in the same. So let's snap to our camera by double clicking on our named view right here. This is our front view. So the first thing we want to change is the background. So that's what I was talking about with environment texture. We definitely do want to change that because it affects the lighting in the scene. Like basically this image that you're seeing here in the square is what's lighting the environment. And that sucks. So that can lend for photorealism. So what I'll do is in Rhino, I can just type environment. I could also do this from V-Ray, but if it works from Rhino, I just rather do it the native way. So right here in studio, it depends. Like I, if I were to download an HDRI, uh, then I do want to use this method. But let's say I just want to use something else like preset in Rhino. I'll add, open up the environments panel and hit this plus sign right under these two. And I'll hit import from environment library. And I'll try to choose something that's either like a studio vibe or outdoors, maybe warehouse. If it's not decrepit, there's a bunch of studio setups I just saw if this one doesn't work out. So we can double click on it to enable it. And that's still not changing our environment texture in V-Ray. So actually, as I'm reading this, program file, chaos group, V-Ray, it is actually saved somewhere in the V-Ray folders, even though it is the Rhino default image. It's actually coming from V-Ray. So I'll hit open here just to open it up. And I could go to my library. That's for materials. We'll talk about that later. I could dig up my V-Ray library of environments, but I have my own. So wherever your in wherever your HDRs or environments are saved at, um, I'm gonna go over into. It's been named Skies <laughs> since like 2013. Not even probably like 2011. I've had my Skies folder, Skies environments. <laughs> And I've been saving and deleting HDRIs. So I do know like this one's across the board all right. I can count on, say this one. They're all kind of soft lighting, which is what I want for like a stylized look. And I'll explain why. We'll give that a second to load, download and load. Well, I'll explain as it downloads. So basically an HDRI, as you may or may not know, as we've covered before, is a 360 image that lights the scene, right? So we can just use that to light our scene and it can look pretty good. And from there we can go further just to add to the photorealism. Or you can add in an environment like that and have it very, very lightly affect your scene, like turn down the intensity of it so that you can add in lights that kind of mirror it or match it. So as you can see, like this is kind of like an overcast, dark, stormy situation. And if I open up my sun settings by typing in sun and getting this panel open, I can go over here and I can turn off sun, which now takes away the rhino sun, which is, an, which is a light in the scene. And we're only using the skylight, meaning the environment texture. 
to light our object. So now it matches, right? Like the uh, the domes here look very dull and very gray and blue, just like the environment. But if I go to the environment in V-Ray, right? Anything I do in Rhino will happen in the main white window and anything having to do with V-Ray happens in this dark gray area. If I go to my environment texture, I can actually tweak it here. So I can give it some color gain, color offset or default color. So I can do this just to lighten it up. It's not gonna make it brighter, but that's where we can go to our render settings. And remember I said we had that camera option for exposure. We can play with the exposure to brighten up our objects. I think ultimately I'd even wanna render without a background. But if I go to my main view, that's working. That's lighting it a lot better, right? It's similar to how it may be lit by the Rhino render, but it's more photoreal. It's more, it's softer. It's ray tracing. Okay, so now I just want to quickly build out some geometry that can help me here. So for example, this is where I suppose using V-Ray geometries can be helpful. We have a Rhino document ground plane but it's not really doing anything here. So what we can do is we can add a geometry by clicking on the bottom left here, going to geometries, and we can add an infinite plane. So that acts as a floor. It's not editable, I don't believe. If I go to select everything, I've only selected those objects. I can go back to my main camera and make sure I can move them up. Ooh, I do have my infinite plane selected. That should have deselected it. Yeah. No. So I think the infinite plane may actually just be following my geometry, but it's not snapping to the bottom. So if we're getting that error, we can always select our infinite plane. I'm gonna switch over to shaded view real quick. infinite plane select objects in scene there it is so i can do scale in rhino Ooh, select objects in scene scale after having selected it and there we go so this is v-ray this has v-ray properties but it's showing up as a rhino geometry and here in shaded view, I can move it under. There we go. Even go into true side view in order to place it just underneath that geometry as close as you can. Doesn't have to be snapped exactly. In fact, when something is perfectly sitting on something else and you don't get like a contact shadow, that also can look weird. I actually favor like Rather than snapping whatever objects directly onto the floor, I actually recommend moving them up like a half a millimeter even. Just because like that little separation creates a shadow, like just as like the footprint for where that meets the ground. Otherwise, it's just like perfectly like floor and then object on floor. And it just looks weird. Just uh, it doesn't sit right. <laughs> um, anyway. That is something I maybe uh, could show. It, it wouldn't show as great here, in this case, as it would in Blender. So maybe I'll, I'll go over that in a Blender file. But let's switch back to Interactive here, just having it load. There we go. So I suppose, yeah, let's do that real quick. If I do Select Objects and Scene, I don't know if I'm going to notice the difference as much here as I would in Blender. But if we give that a second to load, we can see this is what it looks like. If we focus here on the right, this platform. This is what it looks like with like a little bit of say like artificial separation. And if I were to snap this infinite plane to this face, let's let that load. See like that's that cylinder sitting right on top of the ground plane. So it just doesn't look right. If I if you create like some fake artificial spacing right there and you get that little separation, um, I know like right there, it's sort of like, it's so little, like you don't even notice that, but you do. 
<laughs> I do. Um, okay. Maybe the, in this file, in, in this case, is like way too minimal. Like, come on, dude. But generally, like half a millimeter is what I go for in Blender. But in this case, you know, we're fine here. So the object is totally indistinguishable from the environment, which is a problem. We'll do that, but we'll fix that by adding some materials here. So we've talked a little bit about lighting. We've only done like an environment texture, but we do have some other lights. Maybe we'll focus on that more for doing an interior shot. So we'll jump into materials. We'll come back to lights. Materials, we can just create a new one here and we'll make it car paint, sure. Generic gives you a lot of options, but if you, there's something else that you can start from like hair, subsurface scattering. Subsurface scattering is something like glass or water or skin, like anything where if light hits it, it doesn't just like bounce off. It's not like a hard surface material because actually light hits your skin and then it diffuses in your skin, right? That's why like our skin looks pink, not because or our ears might look pink, not because our skin is pink, but because the light shining through the ear and bouncing in your ear makes it look pink. So anyway, so I'm surface scattering, that's as easy as I can put it. Car paint is what I'm going for. So we've got car paint here and we've got a blue color and it's not applying onto anything. That's because I'd have to select all these objects except for the ground plane and then select this material in the v-ray editor right click and hit apply to selection you can also apply it to a layer but in our case applying to selection is going to be easiest uh, i may have to restart the render for it to kick in let's see nope Let's go over into the V-Ray panel and figure out why this isn't working. So if I go select this object and then in the properties panel or wherever you have this little uh, material icon, this little paint icon, let's see, we do have in fact the car paint set up as a V-Ray material. But I do remember <laughs> I had gone into my settings and I had hit a material override on everything to make it gray so that I could do my lighting. So we're gonna enable this again later when we add in some lights to the interior to make sure we get our lighting right. We, go, we don't get distracted by the materials. But with that off, we can now see that car paint. All right, there it is. So we don't want it to be blue, we want it to be white. So I'm just gonna go ahead and hit the color right there on the material. And if you're not getting the side panel, you gotta hit this arrow right here to expand the menu. So that goes on both directions. And uh, by the way, Cosmos, which if you open in this way, it says browse materials in Cosmos. That is V-Ray's collection of materials and assets, which would be dope if I were paying for it. And if you definitely, if you wanna render right inside Rhino and not have to use another software and this is gonna make your life easier and you render, you have to render quite a bit, like this is a great option because the same document you do all your technical drawings and all your modeling, you can also get some decent renders out of it and it is a subscription model, but you they've really finessed it now where it's really easy to just access everything you need very, very quickly. You can get your own materials, you can create your own materials, you can save money that way. But um, yeah, if you're trying to work professionally, I always find that you're able to do more work with the right tools and having the right library of materials or library of assets is an investment that helps you do more work. So. Anyway, not plugging for V-Ray. I am uh, just using the trial anyway, <laughs> but there we go. Just by setting a car paint to white, we're still having this totally dissolve with the background. So I have to make a choice here because, well, let's first uh, adjust our exposure to make sure 
I mean, A, I don't care about the background here, but B, I don't want the object to end up being purely white. You know, even if it's meant to be a pure white, you can always spec that out. But in the render, you want it to be off-white, light gray. You don't want pure white. So this is actually great right here, what we have going on. So I could tell that once I mask out the environment, like this material is going to work. So now I need to select this and I need to make it into glass. So I'll select it. I'll go over to here, my assets, and then hit new asset down on the left, materials. And for glass, we want to make it, we want to select two-sided material. So generally, all materials are only shown on one side of the face, which is the direction the face has, what we call a normal. And two-sided is if you have a geometry that has no thickness, it's just a surface with no thickness, like our glass panel is. Well, two-sided will make it so that it just affects both sides, not just the front facing face of a surface. So I'll right click this and hit apply to selection. And it looks pitch black when it should look transparent, right? This is our little material preview here. So we'll mess with the translucency here just so that it's uh, not fully translucent. Oh, we have front material set to none. So we actually, <laughs> So two-sided just means like we can slot two materials into the front and the back, right, of that surface. So we actually need to create a glass material in order to put onto the front of the two-sided material. So we'll hit new material and we will go with generic. And for generic, we want to go to opacity and turn down the opacity. We want to make it very reflective. We do want reflection IOR, I believe, but we don't want to mess with that too much. No metalness, reflection glossiness, and then we could always mess with the tint of the glass. So here it is like tinted, like tinted black, but following with the opacity. So it's pretty, you know, it's that easy really. We want to have some refraction, sure. Um, and we can turn up the reflection as well. I wish I could uh, zoom in on this thing, but I suppose the only thing I can do is make it bigger for you to see the material better. No, I can't even make this any bigger than it is. So that's as much of the material as I can show you. But anyway, I, I, if you turn up the reflection color, if you see the update here, you get a bit more reflection. We do want refraction. Just a little bit at least. Fog color, uh, I'll leave that to default. Translucency, so if we turn up opacity all the way, right? This is what the material looks like with no opacity change. And if we change translucency to volumetric, we see nothing happening, right? So if we turn down the opacity, what this is actually doing, the translucency set to volumetric, basically means it understands that this is a solid translucent material. So there should be some light, you know, within the material, within the object, right? Is what the translucency calls for. When it's set to volumetric, the volume of the geometry is going to act with some translucency, not just at the surface level. So we want to enable that. All right. And that's it. We got our glass. We now go to two sided and we go to front material. We set that to generic and boom, that's updated to a glass. So we've got glass, we've got car paint. Anything else worth covering over materials? I mean, there's a bunch of stuff here. You can blend two materials together. So similarly to the two-sided, you could hit blend and this material could blend the base material with uh, another layer. So we can add here plus to add another layer on top of that base material, but we'll leave that alone. Um, okay. So feel free to ask questions in the chat, but uh, I can cover materials anymore if you have questions. I'm gonna go into lighting real quick because essentially by going into my render elements here and asking for a material ID color, I'm gonna end up with this layer at the end along with my render. 
And this layer allows me to, in Photoshop, remove the background, separate objects, blah, 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 blah. So that's why I don't care about the background because my material ID is gonna give me the ability to remove the background, mask any object. And I do wanna enable the denoise, that way it matches perfectly on top of each other because I do have denoise on for my render. All this is because I can move into my interior shot. So I'll double click on interior here and now we're inside the space and it is way too dark. We wanna add a light. So I'm just gonna add like some edge lighting to make it kinda sci-fi-ish. So on our V-Ray toolbar here, I'm gonna add in a rectangle light tool. And I'm gonna just click on that and it's gonna give me the ability to draw a light. Perhaps, I hit escape there, I'm gonna do shaded to add in the light so you can see better. And so I don't have to load a render every time I add something. So I hit a rectangle light tool and then I just draw a line and then, okay, we go to top view, there we go. I don't know why this is, uh, I'm not snapping to the right thing, so I'm using top view. But with the rectangular light on V-Ray, I'm gonna draw a straight line and then that turns into a rectangle. So I'm gonna just do it out this way, go back to my interior shot but make sure I'm able to select it. Let's see, there it is. Interior shot. Ah, I placed the light in the wrong one. So we'll just move it over. <laughs> there we go. So we have our light overhead. I'm gonna make sure it is within the scene. So we'll now make this view, oops, not technical, but rendered. V-Ray Interactive. Okay, so here's our rectangle light. We've got a bunch of light inside, just moving this into place. I'm gonna scale it, make it kind of thinner. And move it up closer to the ceiling. So that's really it for a rectangle light. You'll notice here under your properties, you have this attributes area for the light. So we can change its intensity. So we can lower it quite a bit. I can continue clicking to lower the intensity of that light so it doesn't shine so, so bright. If you did wanna add a lot more to the photorealism rather than using an a rectangular light, which I would put as equivalent as you see in the preview here as an area light. So like basically a large light source, like such as a window or something like that. Uh, you could also tweak the intensity of it here and its size as well. But if you wanna go for photorealism, for an interior scene, you wanna use an IES light. So that's worth talking about. If we hit over here, IES light tool, and then I just place this somewhere around the table just to, it's gonna be like a cone shape. And I'll just draw it out just like that. And then it's gonna prompt us to open up an IES file. So same thing, this IES file I have from when I started using V-Ray in 20, two thousand, not even, 2000. When was I in seventh, no, ninth grade? When was I in ninth grade? Oh no. 15 years ago, what's that? 2008? 2008. So this has remained in my file since 2008. Some IES lights I first bought way back when. So I'm gonna open up this folder actually. And actually if, uh, if you're sourcing real lights, Lighting companies usually include an IES file for their light fixtures if they're well specced out so that you're able to render what it would look like if you use their lights. So a lot of distributors or manufacturers for light will include these type of files for like Revit, rendering, V-Ray, uh, in order for you to understand what it would be, simulate what it'd be like to use their product. And what I'm looking for here is an image file that references all these lights. JPEG, there you are. So this is what IES lights file are. 
right? So they have different <laughs> lighting conditions, what you might see from a ceiling LED light or whatever else. So we could just pick one that looks kind of cool. Like 26 is pretty dramatic. I like that. So let's go with that, number 26. So that's in this main file. I'm just gonna look for light 26. And I started doing that, by the way, like doing the JPEG thing with my templates as well. So if I have a template set up for Rhino or a template set up for rendering in Blender, in the same folder as that template, I will have a image of what that template outputs. Um, or even beforehand in those folders or files because that way I just like basically have a catalog of where I want to start. Okay, so we don't see much because it's not very intense, so we'll turn it up. And, oh, I'm turning up the rectangle light. IES light, select objects in scene. Where are you? There it is. Working from camera is not helping me. So I'm gonna just <laughs> rotate this light and make it smaller. There we are. Move it into the space, whoops. Make it even smaller. This is a weird way. I feel like I'm distorting it, but I guess not. Yeah, it like resets every time I distort it. Okay, so there's our weird cone. So I work a lot out of camera from Blender. Don't do that in Rhino, apparently. All right, let's switch back to render view in our thing here. Uh, the V-Ray Interactive. And I suppose I could also do it this way so I can work in multi-view. There we go. So I can rotate this light so it points down into the space. I'm just fixing the shape here real quick. There we go. Why does it always kind of become a cone like that? All right, and then we want to increase its intensity. So its intensity is zero. So if we start turning it up. Let's see. Not seeing a change here. Is it pointing to anything? Should it be larger? Shape, point, shape, circle. Oh, the shape from the IES file. Uh, this light is way too intense. It should just be working. All right, let's reset the render. When in doubt, just reset stuff. There we go. Yeah, well, I saw it for a second, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess that's a thing. If you add in lights, uh, change out materials, whatever, consider uh, resetting your render. Now it's gone again. Oh, I see that my, your preview can also switch to GPU, by the way, over here on the top right. Light ID negative one, light is enabled. Hmm. Let's make it a sphere light. Nothing. It doesn't want to work. Maybe it's my IES file. Maybe it's outdated. Let's try a different one. Yo, General Eight. See you there in the chat. Thanks for dropping in. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm going to make this light like orange or yellow. That way I'll really know when it starts working. <laughs> Because now I'm concerned, or just, you know, screw the IES file. Uh, I'm doing everything right. I'm not doing anything wrong. Maybe it's part of the trial. Uh, you can't use IES lights. They're not fully enabled. 
This is what I should be seeing. I have a light in there. All right. Moving on. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, permanently delete that asset. Um, we had a rectangle light in there. I'm just going to select it. Or I guess I got to bring it back. Or as I explained, lights already. Just forget about lights altogether. I suppose, well, the light, you know, the rectangle light, you'll see here we got this arrow, like a purple arrow from its center. We see it right here. So that's the direction the light is in uh, for a rectangle light. But for the IES light, it's just whatever way that cone is pointing should be. So, anywho, I did just mention that we can do a color change on the scene light. And other lights that we have are dome lights, which is similar to an environment light, point lights. Uh, you can mess with the sun panel and a directional light tool. Directional is similar to an area or a rectangle light in the sense that directional, except directional doesn't have any size or anything. General 8 says, bro, checked out V-Ray's price out of curiosity. It's so expensive. It's a problem. <laughs> the app's got to come down. I agree. I mean, I use Blender because it's free. <laughs> There's no overhead to being a 3D artist. Uh, well, your computer. But once you got the computer, you get Blender and you can get to work. <laughs> um, and you know what? That makes it so that so many people use it and that so many people th feel grateful about using the software that there's just as many people contributing not just as many but there's a much much higher volume of people contributing to the education and the use of that software because it's free and on top of that it's open source not that you know v-ray provides a good product but yeah, it's expensive. Like you have to really like, just be like, okay, I'm just gonna use V-Ray in this very, very specific way to do these very specific things. I'm gonna use the tools that this software makes useful for me to use. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of layers we can peel back from this, but that covers materials and lights with V-Ray. I mean, there's a lot more depth to it, but in order to just kind of get some preliminary renders here. And again, this is like a stylized render. Like I'd love to use a render like this uh, with the negative space. So if I did this view, let's say, and this were like a home page or even a title screen to a presentation, and you had like, I was about to point to my monitor as if you could see that. But uh, <laughs> let's say, like, yeah, like, where where this rectangle and screen i'm trying to illustrate this as best as possible where this magenta rectangle is on screen you could put like a tagline there and a header or this could even be for like a website shot like these type of renders led themselves really good for progress process and uh yeah progress too but process imagery and like abstract imagery like that like because it's monochrome and because it's so simplistic it doesn't detract you can add a title with this slide and it's gonna look great. You can even add like a panel here on the side for some information. So like that's the use case I'd give this uh, this render. And actually I love this exterior scene with like the light pouring out of the front. So let's hit the final render. We'll bring out the asset editor. Um, we'll stop the current render. And this is where we go to our settings and we set to progressive. And we have this added panel here on the right with more render settings. So a bunch of stuff that can be looked at here, but I'm just focusing in on the fact that, I mean, on the first pass, this is all fine. You don't have to change anything on this. Denoise are on, make sure that is on. And for the final render, I do tend, I mean, this is the case in Blender. I don't know if it'd be the case here as well but I do tend to prefer Intel's open image denoise for denoising. I find that it makes a lot less weirdness than optics for sure. Um, it's just like when you have dark areas with a denoiser, the denoiser can actually screw up your dark areas, but open image denoise I find handles that best. 
we don't lose much detail with that. Um, yeah, all right, let's hit render now that we set it to progressive. I set the quality to medium. We don't need high for this. And there we go, we got a run in. Our final render out of V-Ray. And yeah, I mean, this is, depends on the, on the use case. Thanks, General 8. Appreciate you liking the render. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it depends on the use case. But when there was a time before I started using, before I knew Blender that well. So the way that I learned Blender was opposite of how most people do. I learned, I started learning Blender just by rendering. So literally the only thing I understood about Blender was importing a 3D model in Blender and then setting up a camera and the render settings. That's what I started knowing. So then I learned lighting and materials and all that. I, and then finally, like recently, I got into modeling in Blender. So I reverse engineered it because I did Rhino modeling, V-Ray rendering. So this is the type of renders I'd get out of V-Ray within Rhino. They're just kind of like process abstract renders. Like it's just like, you know, apply a couple of materials, set up a light, hit render, you got some images, right? And I would export to Blender once I wanted really high quality photorealistic, more other stuff. You can get that in V-Ray and Rhino, but you got to jump through more hoops, I feel. And there's just a lot more friction in the software uh, to get that done. I find that when it comes to just getting something like photoreal um, and with ease of use, once you've known a good amount of Blender, that's just been the tool I gravitated to. But again, like if you're just trying to keep it within one software and you don't mind paying a subscription to have these tools handy to really take this into a much, much further level and you have access to a supercomputer, it makes sense. Like this is a corporate solution, let's say. For a bootstrapping solution, I don't know, I wouldn't do V-Ray. <laughs> um, all right, so we got our image and it's way too overexposed. So I'm gonna cancel out of it and I'm gonna l eh, lower my exposure by bringing the number back up to even 11, so that's fine. While I take any questions or any other comments, that's way too dark, but I'll Photoshop it, it's fine. Um, any other questions or comments you'd like to drop in at this time? I'm just gonna say right now, uh, next Tuesday or Wednesday, um, or potentially both, they will not be live streams. I am going to release a video at 8 p.m. Um, I will send out more details on that, but just a quick disclaimer on next week's streams. It's not gonna be a live thing. I'm gonna launch a video at the time at which a stream would take place. Um, so yeah, this came out way, way too dark. I kinda like the reflection of the clouds on the object itself though, but uh, but yeah, I mean, if I stop the render, um, I always forget like with progressive, like there was a, progressive just kind of tends to go on forever unless you set like a time limit to the render in the main settings. But if you just export this, save it somewhere, like not your desktop, I'm totally not saving to my desktop. You are not seeing me <laughs> save to my desktop right now. Uh, you know, just some tw simple tweaks to it. Even like that, like kind of noisy is kind of a style. I did say I was going stylized. We can increase brightness and exposure, increase contrast. It's a little bit too much noise, honestly. Vignetting is another camera effect. It's where the corners get dark or light, depending on what you got going on, but vignetting light for this type of stuff is great. Saturation, so desaturated. And then shadows, create a bit more contrast. Boom. Stylized render out of V-Ray. So yeah. Uh, don't see anything in the chat, so just to close out, I'll say remember to set a time limit to your render so that the denoiser kicks in, and that is on the right hand side. 
render output, save frame effects. So many settings. Um, oh, bokeh, that's another, that's another way of naming uh, your, what is it called, depth of field. Oh my goodness, it was at the very top. <laughs> Quality, time limit, and minutes. So you can set a time limit or you can set a noise limit to end your rendering. So let's say if I set as a time limit, maximum three minutes, you know, and then run that again, and I'll get a higher quality version that I can use for my thumbnail. Anyway, that's it for today's stream. We did some V-Ray for Rhino. If you'd like more deeper in-depth content on V-Ray for Rhino, that can definitely be done. I can also kind of bring in an older file that has more detail that we could do something more photo real as opposed to this. Um, but yeah, always leave, feel free to leave comments. Let me know what you think. And if you're watching this for the first time, you do this every week, consider subscribing. Next week, you'll see me again, either in video <laughs> in video. So have a great night, everyone. Peace.